Welcome, everyone, to What Happens After the Compiler. My name is Anush. I'm a principal engineer at Asenium in Norway, where we are we're a startup doing a new and more efficient general purpose CPU design. I'm also the author of cppquiz.org, which is a quiz site about C++. And you can occasionally find me on Twitter on these uh, various accounts uh, over there. Before we start, I want to just mention two things. This talk is um, only about what happens on Linux. Now, some of these things are exa exactly the same on Windows. Some are similar, some are different. I'm not an expert on Windows, so I'm going to your talk tomorrow to learn more about Windows. So OFAC has a talk about linking on, uh, on both tomorrow, so I'll hopefully learn some new stuff. Um, but yeah, this one is in particular about Linux. Uh, also, if you have any questions during the presentation about what I'm saying, what's up on the slides, please raise your hand right away so we can resolve that while we are on the topic and the slides are still there. If you want me to elaborate on something or you have some like, follow-up comments and some, or something, then please hold those to the end because I've set aside some time at the end for, for broader questions. So what happens after the compiler? Let's try to figure that out, and let's try to use a simple function to, to see what, what happens after the compiler, and what happens when you run it actually on your computer. This should be a simple enough function. This is basically the simplest C or C++ program I could think of. So let's use this as a starting point to figure out what happens after the compiler. Who has used Compiler Explorer? Yeah, quite a few. It's a very handy site where you can just paste in your code and you can see the assembly that get, gets generated. So I just pasted it into Compiler Explorer and I got this assembly out. So maybe I can use this to figure out what's going on. So there will be a bunch of assembly in this talk, but you don't have to have any background uh, understanding any assembly to follow the talk. If there is any of it that you have to understand, I will explain those parts and the rest we will just ignore. Um, so for instance, for this one, there's a bunch of stack bookkeeping and stuff that we'll just ignore. This is the interesting part. Um, how do you return one from a function? Well, you put one in EAX, that's what this instruction here says, put one in EAX, that's where you're supposed to put the return value. And then you call a return, and that's all there is to it. So um, yeah, when, the, when, the com when your computer is executing this function, you put the value one into that register and return and uh, you're done. So if we assume that this compiles, links, and loads, and runs, and everything, it's plausible that this program is going to actually exit with the status code of one, and there is no trick questions or any magic here. But there is a bunch of interesting things still to learn about how does it actually run, how does it do things, and like there's some stuff happening before it and some stuff happening after it, but the function itself should be very trivial. It did get a bit complicated, though, so I wanted to refactor it. So this value one, I extracted that into another function. So I have now this compute function to compute the value one that I want to return from main. Um, so that's, that's a nice little refactor. I then pasted all of that through Compiler Explorer again, and I got this. And the compute function here is identical to the main function uh, on the previous slide. It's exactly the same function, except the name has changed, right? It's still taking no arguments, it's returning an int, and that int is uh, one, so this looks exactly like main looked on the previous slide. Um, yeah, putting one into AX and returning. And then main also looks pretty simple, it still has all this boilerplate it has to do, and then it's just calling compute. So it also looks like a, a simple function. But, but how can it call compute? Like the, the CPU doesn't know about any compute function. The only thing the CPU knows about is addresses and registers and memory and stuff like that, and like adding stuff together. It, it doesn't know, it's never heard the name compute before, so, so how does this actually work? I'll try to show this here. So your program is basically just a long list of instructions. So I've drawn up like yeah, seven instructions here, just arbitrary instructions. And the CPU has this instruction pointer here, which will point to some instruction, and it will just go from there. So initially, it will point to the entry point of your program, and it will just like churn through all the instructions. So what it will do, it will bump the instruction pointer, and then execute instruction one. It will bump the instruction pointer, then execute instruction two. It will bump the instruction pointer, then execute instruction three, which happens here in my program to be a jump instruction. 
Now, there's nothing magical about the jump instruction. It's just that the thing that the jump instruction does is just change the instruction pointer. So let's say I'm changing it to point down here instead, and the CPU just keeps on bumping the pointer, uh, executing the instruction. It just goes like this all the time. And that's basically all your CPU can do. So call compute. How, how, does that, how can you call compute? There must be something here that Compiler Explorer doesn't want us to know. So let's try to figure out what, what is actually going on here. So here's the same program again. And I can compile it like this into an object file. I won't link it into an executable yet, just, just compile it. And I want to look at it. So I'll start with just like dumping it. This is just hex dumping this, this object file. And here's how it looks like. Can anyone read any of this? I hope not. Yeah, can you read some of it? <laughs> there is actually a, thing, a, a little thing you can read. This 7f is a magic number, and then it goes the ASCII code for E, L, and F. So that's the executable and linkable uh, format that's on Linux. So that's the format of your object files, that's the format of your executables, your shared objects, stuff like that. So that's this little header. That's the only thing I hope that anyone can recognize here. So XXD is uh, obviously not the right tool to, to figure out what's inside of this binary. Another much better tool is objdump. So objdump is a nice way to inspect your, your ELF binaries. And I'm giving it W for wide output, D for disassembly, and R for show relocations. And I'll get back to relocations in a while. So this is a better tool to see what's inside of this object file. And I told it to disassemble my stuff, so here, it's, it's saying, well, here's the disassembly of the text section. And the text section is where your code goes. So all of the machine code that the compiler emits for all of, of, of your C or C++ or whatever goes in the text section, the code section. And here it has the compute function. And um, the only thing that's actually in there is the machine instructions. And the rest is objump and being nice and like showing me some stuff. So objump knows that Compute starts here at address 0. And then here are all the bytes of compute. So we have F3, 0, F1, E, F, A. We can actually find those yeah, here. So this here is compute down in our uh, object file. And then it's showing the address of each, each instruction. So this instruction starts on offset 0 in the text section, and then this instruction here. And it's showing the assembly as well. So it's disassembling this machine code into a readable assembly, <coughs> saying, so here's an Ember64 instruction at address 0, here's a push RBP at address 4, and so on. But these bytes here, these bytes are the only thing that's actually in the object file, and that will actually be in memory when the program runs. So we can see one of the things it's doing is exactly what we just saw in Compiler Explorer, is that it puts the value 1, the return value, into EAX, which we said is the return register. So that's the disassembly of uh, compute. Here's main, and as we just saw previously as well, it has a bunch of boilerplate around, around it. And then it's moving, it's putting zero into the return register. Um, I don't put zero in, in, in that register anywhere here. So why would it do that? And why would it only do it for main and not for compute? What happens if you don't return from main? If you don't have a return statement, then it implicitly will return zero. So this is just C and C++ saying if you don't actually write return something, it should implicitly return zero. So the compiler just went and put a return zero just, just to be, uh, just to be uh, sure that you actually return something. And that obviously goes away if you compile with optimizations. The interesting part here is when it's actually trying to call compute. So how can we call compute? It has here the, this instruction E8, that's the opcode for, uh, for calling something, and then we have these other bytes saying what's the address of the thing we're trying to call. So we're trying to call compute, and it says call and then zero. And, and zero is where compute uh, lives. You can see like compute is here, at address zero in the text section. So is, that, is this correct now? Is that, like, is that the address of compute? And um, probably not. And here's a like, figure that I'm going to show many times during the presentation. I'm illustrating here that you have two object files that have been compiled, and they each have a header with some metadata, like what's in here, what are the names and everything. And then we have a text section, which is where the code goes, 
and we have a data section, which is where most of your data will go, and we have a bunch of other sections with stuff like debug information, like symbol tables and, and whatnot. But let's focus on the, the text and the data right now, or the code and the data. So we have these two object files, and now we're gonna link them. So we're gonna take these two object files, link them into an executable here. So the compiler here knows, like, okay, where, where is computing here? I know where I put it. But then the linker is gonna, like, move everything around. So the compiler doesn't know where the linker is gonna put everything. So whatever it knew about where it put it, well, the linker could put it somewhere else. So it, it doesn't really know. And eventually we're gonna load this into memory. And now it's even worse. Like we, we at least don't know where this is going to get loaded into our virtual address space, like somewhere. So the compiler doesn't know where uh, compute will end up being. So it can't put the address here. So these zeros, that's actually just an accident. What these zeros, why they're here is because the compiler went, well, I'm gonna output this code but I'm not sure where the linker is gonna place everything. I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not sure where it's gonna get loaded in memory, so I just give up. I just put some zeros here just because I gave up. And I'm going to leave a little note for the linker to say, maybe you can help me later, linker. And that, that little note is called a relocation. And that's, that's the next uh, topic. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, that's, yeah, that's a note for the linker. Yeah, and um, in particular, then um, this, what we can do is we can use relative addressing. So even though the linker doesn't know where stuff is going to get loaded, but it knows where it puts everything relative to each other. So the linker is unable to, to figure out, like, okay, how, how, how far should I jump here? Not where, but how far. So relocation, that, that's the name of the, the note to the linker from the compiler saying, I gave up, can you please help me? Um, and here is exactly the same as we saw on the previous slide, just copied over to a new one, uh, the objump of this main.o with the compute and the main function. And I can actually list all the relocations in here. So there are two nice tools for, for elf, looking into elf uh, files. So this objump that we've seen here, and read elf is the other one. And with read elf, I can say dash r for list all the relocations in this object file, and then w for write outputs. So that's gonna list all the relocation relocations in this file, and there is only one. This just this call to compute. And the linker doesn't understand like assembly or machine code or something. The linker just understands sections and like bytes and stuff. So the relocation doesn't say anything about instructions to patch up or anything. The, the, the relocation just says at offset 1D, uh, where are we? Uh, yeah, here, that's offset 1D. Here you have to put in something. And what do I want you to put in here? Compute minus four. Uh, so why minus four? So compute here is, so the relocation is at 1D, and I want to put in the relative address of compute. So I, I have to go, I'm here at 1D, I want to go to zero, so I have to go minus 1D. So I have to put in the distance to compute, that's minus 1D. But by the time we get around to executing this instruction, the instruction pointer will already have been bumped down here, so I also have to subtract one, two, three, four extra bytes. So that's why it's saying compute minus four. And you can also see objump is also saying compute minus four. So objump is also uh, looking into the relocation section to just display it in line with the rest of the stuff since I, I gave it the dash r to show relocations. But all the relocations are often a different section. So in the text section where the code is, it's only the code. And the relocation is just some notes some, somewhere else. Um, so maybe we can see if we can, can uh, solve this relocation manually. Uh, if I, uh, yeah, I, I figured out, well, we're gonna do minus D here, and then we have to, comp uh, minus one D, and we have to compensate for these four bytes, so I get minus 21. So if we want to try to resolve the relocation manually, we think that what we need to put in here is minus 21 in order for this to work at the runtime, because that's the distance you have to modify the instruction pointer to, to point at compute in, the, in memory. So if I uh, link this, I take my object file, I'll link it into an executable, and I dump it again. And I think I forgot to say earlier, I said wide output, disassembly, relocations, 
And this part here is saying, please use the Intel assembly syntax when you disassemble it, because I think that's the most commonly used syntax these days. So um, yeah, I'm just asking you to, to use that. So here's what it looks like after it has been linked. So now, now I'm dumping the actual executable, like linking is done on everything, not just the object file, but the entire executable. And the first thing we can notice is that compute is no longer at zero. Now it's at 11.29, so that's the, the address within the text section. So more stuff has been added to my executable. And here's the call to compute. And we can see that the relocation is now gone. The linker has been able to put in the actual value here. So we're still saying E8 for call. And then what are we going to call? We're going to call DFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
So I now still have, maybe I can actually just point down here. Uh, I have main calling compute in main.c, and then library.c, I have the compute function. So now it's off in a different C file, which will be turned into a different object file. And I just have library.h just to have a, like a forward declaration. So what happens now? I compile my library, and that's just the same as before. Here's the compute function. It's putting one into the return register. I'm done. The interesting thing is how can main call this one? So if I compile and dump it again, what's it doing? It's saying E8, which is a relative call. And it's a bunch of zeros. The compiler gave up. And there's a note to the linker saying, can you help me here? So that there's a relocation again. So for multiple files, it's exactly the same as for one file. So since you already know how to do it for one file, you know how to do it for many files. So there's nothing more to learn here. So that's, that's neat. Um, and the reason is that in any case, the compiler doesn't know what to do. The compiler doesn't know where things are going to end up, so it has to defer to the linker. Um, and in any case, the linker does know everything, because the linker is writing all of this stuff out here. The linker is placing all of these sections, so when it's writing out main, it already knows where it's going to write out compute. So then it can just patch up this relocation here to put, point it to the right place. The linker is writing everything, and the linker knows everything, so it can just fix stuff. This only works for static linking. So I will mention uh, a bit about dynamic linking at the end, but this is, this is for static linking. It's pretty simple for static linking. So if I now take my multiple object files, uh, link them into one executable called main, and again, I dump stuff, um, then we see here that we have main and compute, and here's the call to compute. So now we have E8, which is again is the, it's the relative call, and it says the address is two relative, right? So by the time we execute this, the instruction pointer will be pointing down here at the next instruction, and then we go, so we're at 11.3b, and we add two to it, one, two, and we're at compute. So that's uh, how that works. We can see that the relocation has been resolved again. And it's also easier when you're jumping forward in memory. It's easier to just add two here than to see this, like, all of these Fs and the twos complement thing, and it's, it's a bit easier. Um, but if I, if I swap the order here of main.o and library.o, then also these will be swapped around again, and you'll have a negative number again. So, um, yeah, but it's a bit easier in this direction. So now we know that the CPU is just churning through one instruction at a time. Uh, and it can then jump places with relative jumps or relative calls. Uh, even though neither the compiler or the linker actually know where things are going to end up eventually in memory. How about data? How does it find data? Let's use some data. So we have this function params because it takes two parameters. It's taking two ints, A and B and it's just adding them together and returning that value. How do you pass A and B into this function? How do you get the result out? How do you access A and B inside of the function? And that's all decided by the calling convention. So every system will have a calling convention deciding all of these things. So uh, on Linux, uh, we have the system V AMD64 um, ABI, which among other things, tell you how do you get stuff in and out of functions. And let's have a look at uh, what, what happens if I compile and dump this again, I, just uh, like we've done many times. Um, here we can see it's accessing A and B here, and it's doing that by looking in EDI and ESI. So the calling convention on my Linux computer says, if you want to pass some ints to a function, here are some registers you should use. The first int goes in EDI, then the second goes in ESI, and I think you have like seven or so of these registers where you just put your ints. So you can call a function with simple data like this without even going to memory. You can just stick it in registers, so it's really fast. Uh, and then it's accessing those, and it's doing some stuff that we don't care about, and finally it's adding this stuff, and add will always put the result in the first operand. So add is gonna add these to registers, put the result in EAX, which again is the return register that my, my calling convention is, is telling me to use, and I'll just return from, from EAX. 
So for parsing some simple ints in and out of functions, you don't need anything fancy. You don't need addresses. You don't need anything. You just use these registers. So it's nothing that you really have to think about regarding linking or, or doing anything complicated at, at runtime. But often you pass, like you, you want to have some value semantics and pass something that's bigger than int. So I have a struct called big thing, and it's just, well, bigger than seven registers. It doesn't matter how it looks like. It's just a fairly large thing. I want to pass that in by value. And then I want to add my int a to some member of this struct. What happens now? Now it's again up to the calling convention how, how to do this. Let's see what it does. I compile and dump it. And the int, I, uh, int a is still in EDI. So it's still using the first integer register for, for this, the int. But the struct has gone on the stack. And the way it works is that now we're like, this, this is the code that's running inside of f. So how does f get access to, to the big thing? And it's doing that relative to rbp. So rbp here is the stack pointer. So on, on x86, the stack is, is growing downwards. So like this, all of these functions have been called, and like the stack pointer is here. Now this is my stack frame. So if I take the top of my stack frame, and I add a bit to it, I will then address into the caller's stack frame. So that's how you pass things by value. Whoever was going to call f will have pushed big thing on a specific place in their stack, stack, stack frame, and then I, in f, I can just add to my stack frame, uh, like the base of my stack, stack frame, add to it so I get into the caller's stack frame. Um, yeah, and again, all relative to the stack. So no matter where I am, the stack is here or here, whatever, I just add to my stack, uh, the, the base of my stack frame, and I'll, I'll find it. So there's nothing uh, for, for the compiler or linker to do any complicated stuff here. The same goes for local variables. So if I have an int result here, which is a local variable, compile and dump it. It's just, again, rbp. Here's my stack, uh, the start of my stack, stack frame. I subtract a bit, so I just go a bit into my stack frame. So local variables, just like parameters, I just use the stack. So all of this is very simple. There's no magic going on. And the question then is, is all data that simple? And whenever I ask, is it that simple, then the answer is no. The, or, otherwise, I wouldn't have asked it like that. So what other kind of data do we have, except for function uh, arguments and return values and, and local variables? Globals. So globals are not so easy. And then you can say, well, you shouldn't use globals. And I think all the talks I've seen today has told me to not use globals, at least not writable ones. But you have some globals, right? You have logging. You have maybe some singletony stuff. You might have some less noble purposes. Um, and uh, yeah, I have a favorite global. Do you have a favorite global? Which one do you use the most? Yeah, std cout. That std cout is just a global variable. So it, we, maybe, maybe IO streams is not your favorite library, but, but, but Cout might be your favorite uh, global. So anyway, we have to, to know about how globals work. And when I say global here, more precisely, I'm talking about variables with static storage duration. So that means that the storage duration of this variable is static. There's only one global for the entire duration of the program. If I have a local variable, the stack is going to move up and down and going to call functions and like different instances of this variable is going to pop in and out of existence as the program is running. For my global here, whenever the program starts, it exists, and then when the program ends, that single instance goes out of, uh, out of, out of scope and gets destroyed. So, so that's called static storage duration, and that's the more precise term. So I have extracted a global here into a global variable, and I want to return it. So I compile and dump this again, like we've done many times. And we can see that we have the disassembly of the text section, like we've seen many times before. And we have the disassembly of the data section. So the data section is where all your normal mutable globals go. Uh, or normally, your globals is hopefully not that mutable. But anyway, they go in this section here. And then objump is trying to be helpful. So there's some assembly code here. You can just ignore it. It's just objump trying to disassemble the value too. So, but the interesting part here is that we can see these bytes. So the global equals 2. Here it is in the data section, at offset zero in the data section. So that's, that's why I put it up here and just ignore the assembly part here. Um, yes, so how do I find 
this value to at runtime. Here is the instruction uh, in main, which is going to access this data. And it does that by saying ab0f, that's the opcode for, uh, for moving something into uh, EAX, and then the address. And the address is just a bunch of zeros. And then there's a little note here to the linker. So by now, we probably recognize that this is the same that we saw for functions, it's a relocation. So it's, it's working in exactly the same way. It puts in the instruction with, us, with just zeros for the operand and then this relocation. So the linker can, after laying everything out, figure out what's the, uh, the offset actually going to be. So it's exactly the same as for functions. So if I link and dump this, we can see that our data is now down here. So our global now lives at the uh, address 4010, still everything hex here. And the relocation is gone from, the, from main, which is now the executable main, not, not the object file main.o, but the final executable. And we can see the relocation is gone, and it's put in the value to ed9. So if you have the instruction pointer now pointing at 1137, you add to ed9, I hope you get 4010, at least I didn't check, but objump at least put a comment here saying, well, it's gonna be 4010, so hopefully objump is, is right. So it has to have this re relocation for global, but if you remember when we extracted our compute function, we made it static, so we made it internal to this object file, no one else can override it, and then the compiler could just put out the, the distance to jump. Can we make global static to avoid the relocation? Can we? And then the answer is no. And here's the reason. The linker is gathering up all these sections, like we've said many times now. It's taking all the text sections, putting them in one big text section, all the data sections in one big data section. So even though all the distances in here stay the same, a distance between sections will not be the same. Suddenly it's a bit further down here. Um, so the, the, the compiler can't, even though if you, if you make it local or in anonymous namespace or whatever, it's, it, the compiler can't know where it's gonna end up, even for static linking. Um, but the linker does know. And when, when this stuff all gets loaded into memory, it doesn't necessarily get loaded in that order. It's not taking the entire binary and mapping it as one. It can like put sections in segments all over the place, but that all over the place thing is decided by the linker. So when the linker writes your executable, it says when operating system you load this process, I want this to be the, like the distance between all my, this is, well, this is where, what the layout will be. And then you can just load it at some offset that you would like to put it in my virtual memory uh, space. But I get to decide the relative layout of all those sections. Yeah, there are, I mentioned, there's just one, this one data section that we've seen so far. And I mentioned that's one of the data sections. And that's because you have different types of globals. You have these two that are initialized to some value. It doesn't matter if they have internal or external linkage. These are globals that are constant initialized to some value. That's one type. Then you have a slightly different type of globals, the uninitialized or zero initialized ones. And why do I group them together? It's because any uninitialized global will actually be zero initialized. So if you forget or omit or don't want to initialize it, it will actually get initialized to zero. And that sounds a bit weird, right? Because we say, don't pay for what you don't use and all of that stuff. So why, why will C++ guarantee us to actually initialize this? And it's because it's free. Because whenever we are loading the program, we are gonna get memory from the OS. So our virtual memory will be mapped to some actual physical memory, and some other process will have been using that memory before us. So they will have their data still lying around in memory, so the OS is gonna zero it out, so that we can't read it, and anyway, it's gonna be full of zeros by the time we get it. So it's, it doesn't, it's not costing our program anything extra to zero initialize this, uh, typically. So that's the zero or uninitialized ones. Then you have the const ones. That's a different type. Again, there's some, some small differences here. And the const and uninitialized one, you could either group it with the uninitialized data or you could group it with the const ones, but it's grouped with the const ones. 
And finally, I have declared a few externs here. So these are not actually defined anywhere in this file. This, this translation unit, this object file, will not have any traces of this. These are just a promise to the compiler that they will eventually exist somewhere. And then I'm just using them down in main. And I compiled and dumped it and just trimmed the output a bit. So we do get relocations for all of them. There's, there's nothing uh, special here except for these, these const ones. They actually got inline by the compiler, even on, on, on zero. But if they weren't inline, they will also have relocations. So the point is that no matter if, like, what kind of special type of globals you have, they are all resolved with the same uh, kind of relocations that we've seen all the time. And here we can see which sections do they end up in. So we have the data section, the one that we've seen a few times, where your mutable globals go, that has some initialization. And again, Objump is trying to disassemble our data, so just ignore that part. But we can see we find our value 1 and 2 here. Now we have a pretty cool section called the BSS, which is where all your uninitialized or zero-initialized stuff goes. And the BSS section doesn't actually exist in your executable. So you could have like a megabyte of zeros in your program, but instead of having then a, a megabyte of zeros in your program, you have just a note saying, please fill in one megabyte of zeros here when you load this stuff into memory. So you don't have to ship all of these zeros to your customers. Then we have the RO data, the read-only data. And it's putting the two const globals into a separate section, which is read-only. And why is it doing that? Like, they are const. Couldn't they just, like, they're already const. You can't modify them. Why, why not just put them in the regular data section? And the reason is that, well, they're const, but you could take a pointer or a reference or whatever to these, and then cast away const and try to modify them. Um, and then, if you have them in the RO data section, you could actually then map the RO data into some read-only memory segment so that it's not possible. Even though you cast away const, you can't modify them. You'll get a seg fault. So this is a, a nice way to, to protect your read-only data. So if we take the same illustration we've seen so many times, but we just like, insert the actual stuff here. So we have the two, uh, we have global and internal here in the data section. Um, and then, yeah, so the, the linker is going to take the, the text section, uh, map it over here, the data section, writing it down here. So it's going to compi combine the global and the internal from, from our file that we saw here. And then some object file hopefully has defined our external variables that we, we saw. So it takes all the object files, data stuff, and st stick them into one data section. The BSS section, I've graded it out because it's just conceptual. It doesn't really exist, neither in the object file nor in the executable. And then the RO data, it's taking these two RO data, things and this one and like group them into one RO data section. And eventually all of this gets loaded and at this point the BSS section actually exists. And as I mentioned before, they don't necessarily get loaded in exactly this configuration. They could be in, and they will be, in different places. But the linker decided that layout, that internal layout of, of the image in memory. So the OS only gets to decide where to load it and then the linker decides to load the layout inside of there. I've also drawn some permissions here, so we can see the text section in memory is going to be mapped into some readable and executable uh, memory. So you want your code to be, you have to read it, and you have to execute it. You don't want to write to it, right? Um, just that would be a security problem. So the, the code is not writable. Data is read and write, and not execute. So you don't want anyone to be able to start like, write, like sending you some, some code in your data, and then manipulating your insertion pointer to start executing your, your data or anything. So that's read, read, write, but not execute. Same with BSS. And RO data at the bottom here is read only. You can't write to it, you can't execute it. So if you wonder when, does, when, when, when are your globals initialized? If they're constant initialized like this, or they're zero initialized or not initialized, they kind of are never initialized. There, there's no code that goes around and sets your constant initialized globals, because when you map these sections into memory, well, these, these the numbers are in that section. And then that, that section just gets mapped into memory, and boom, your globals are there even before you start a program, just by loading this, these sections into memory. If you have some dynamic in, initialization, uh, or say you have a global with a constructor and stuff, well, that has to run at some point. 
before it gets used. So that's a different story. But for simple initialization like this, there kind of there isn't any code that goes around and sets your your globals. Uh, yeah, I'll skip this part. Yeah, I mentioned everything is simple-ish when you have static linking because the linker knows everything. The difference between static and dynamic linking for, for the purposes of this talk is what is known when. What does the compiler know? What does the linker know? And what does the loader know? So that's a bit different between static and dynamic linking. And also what can be done at those points. What's, what can the compiler do with the information it has? What can the linker do with the information it has? And what can the loader do with the information it has? So we, we saw this before, how the, the CPU is a very simple machine, uh, or it should be at least. Um, having this instruction pointer pointing at an instruction and just bumping instruction pointer, execute, bump, execute, bump, execute, all the way down until your program is done. And we saw that the CPU needs then addresses of functions and data to be able to, to uh, call functions or access data or anything. And the, we saw that the compiler often doesn't know because the compiler doesn't know where stuff is going to end up after linking. And as long as you're doing static linking, well, the linker can fix all of that. What if you're doing dynamic linking? So we still have our two object files going into one executable, being loaded somewhere in memory, and we don't know where, but we don't care because everything is relative addressing. But maybe there's a shared object here that we depend on. So we have this SO1 here with the text and the data, and that gets mapped somewhere in memory. We, the linker doesn't know. And maybe that SO is using a different SO again, and maybe we're using also that other SO, or maybe we're not using that SO. And in general, like we at link time don't know where everything is going to end up. So, so we, the linker can't just fix relocations and be done with it. We, we don't know yet until uh, the program gets loaded. But when the compiler didn't know, it left a relocation for the linker. So maybe the linker can just leave a relocation for the loader so the loader can fix this at load time. And if I ask, is it, is it that simple? And the answer is no. Because shared objects really are very shared. Not only can you have like 500 programs on your disk all using the standard library and you just have one standard library SO somewhere and they all share that. So you don't, when you ship your 500 executables, you don't need to ship 500 copies of the standard library statically linked into those. They can just use the one from the system uh, at runtime. So you save disk space, you save like download time and, and whatnot. But you can actually also share the shared object at runtime. So if all of these 500 processes load the same shared object, they don't have to load 500 copies. You can just have, so, so if I'm one of these uh, processes, uh, it doesn't have to be 500 different programs either. It can be 500 instances of the same program but in different processes, right? And they all need the shared library, the, the standard library. So I will, in my virtual memory space, I will see a copy of the standard library. But that will just map down to physical memory, which is the same section. So the, um, the text section is just mapped into my space. So the OS will load one copy of all the code in the standard library, and then all of the processes that use it will just have their virtual memory mapped to the single page of physical memory. So if, if I use like a, a library that has one megabyte of code in it, and I have 500 processes using it, I only use one megabyte of actual memory. That's pretty neat. But many processes are now sharing the same text section. So if I want to just leave relocations for the loader, so you could imagine the loader as it's loading my process and fixing up relocations in the text section. Well, if I do that for one process, and I have other processes using the same text section, well, then I'll, this info will be wrong for all the other processes. So we can't mess around with the, the, with the shared library when, you, when you're loading it because it's shared in memory between a lot of different processes. So we can't modify it. What can we do instead? We saw already that you have many sections in your program. So if, if, you have, if this is a shared object that's being loaded into my process, the text section is read-only. 
So I can share that with many others. The RO data is read-only. I can share it with many others and avoid duplicating all of that memory. But each process has to have its own data and its own uh, BSS here, like the writable data stuff has to be a separate copy for each process. So some, da some data here is local to the process, because if I change a global in my process, I don't want another process to see uh, that value, right? So we have process local uh, things here. And what we do is we just give every process a new section that's readable and writable. And it's called GOT, and that is the global offset table. And the global offset table is a table of offsets of globals. So each process gets a separate copy of the GOT, and the GOT is just a list of pointers to all the globals I'm using. So if, if for instance, I have this program, um, I have a function called using data, which is uh, um, accessing some external int data here, I get a pointer to data in the GOT. So rather than like the trick we saw earlier where we have a relocation to get the data because the linker knew, now the linker doesn't know, so what we instead do is first we look in our copy of the global offset table, where does the data uh, global actually live? Is, is someone speaking somewhere? Um, it's, it's a bit distracting, sorry. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, so instead of accessing this data directly, we have to emit some code from the compiler to go look in the global offset table. So the compiler will go, in here, somewhere here, is like where is data, and then it will call it. So maybe a bit like your vtable, kind of. It's like a table of where are all my globals. So if this is a shared object, and I'm compiling this into an object file, I expect to see two instructions. One to look in, in uh, the GOT, and then one to actually get the data. But I'm only getting one here. I'm getting the 8b05 again, like the move thing and eventual zeros and a relocation. So why, why didn't I get the GOT thing? I'm compiling an object file for use in a shared object. What compiler option did I forget to pass? FPIC, yeah. So if I forgot to pass the option saying, please allow this code to be used in a shared object. Uh, I, sorry, I forgot to, so here, <laughs> here is the thing. You can see it's only having one instruction here. It's just having, it's just the zeros and the relocation. Because I forgot to give fpic, and fpic is the option I have to give when I compile something that will eventually be part of a shared object. If I don't specify dash fpic when I compile it, and hopefully you don't have to since you use CMake and it will just figure it out, uh, or some other build system, but if I forget to pass fpic, the linker will say, you, sorry, you can't use this in a shared object because I have to do something special for this code to be usable in a shared object. And the special thing, is that it has two instruction, instructions for the move instead of one. So it has one instruction to go look in GOT, what's the address of data, so it's it first, uh, yeah, so it's doing that first, and then a second to actually get the data, and we'll get to the details. The first instruction is how, how to find the address of data in the GOT, and then it's the relocation thing again. So the compiler has to figure out, like, oh, right, what's the distance down here to GOT? And that the linker knows, because the linker is making the GOT section like in the same executable or in the same shared object. So the, the compiler, or the linker knows how far is it down to the data member in GOT, the, the index of the, or the pointer to data. So we'll have this one, move, and then the data address in GOT. And after I've gotten that address into RAX, I can now actually go into RAX, which, uh, or like follow that pointer in RAX, which is now pointing to where data actually is. So the GOT is then like just a table of all, your, all my globals, and the loader, when, when the stuff gets loaded into memory, all the shared objects get loaded, the loader will patch up all of these uh, entries in the GOT. Question? Yeah, the question is, will every shared object have its own GOT? Um, yes, that's true. So when you load your executable and like three shared objects, the executable will have one GOT for any globals that it is using, and each shared object will have one for the stuff it's using. So uh, if, I, if I have a shared object that has five globals, 
and then I use that shared object, my GOT will only contain entries for the ones I'm actually accessing in that. So the, the GOT is on the kind of on the consumer side. So if I, if I need these 12 globals from these different SOs, I get entries for them in my binary. Um, excellent questions, those kinds of questions, please do ask them during the, yeah, so we have one from uh, over here. Uh, what's the difference between fpick in uppercase and lowercase? The difference between fpick in uppercase and lowercase, uh, that's the casing, whether it's uppercase or... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know either. If anyone knows what's the difference between fpick with upper and lowercase, uh, I'm not sure. But anyway, when your program gets started and the loader loads all your shared objects, it will populate all of these GOTs. And hopefully, you don't have too many globals. Maybe you have like five globals at most, right? So it's, it's pretty cheap to just patch up all of these global offset tables. So if I then finally make a shared object, I link my file.o here, my object file, into an SO and dump it. We can see we still have these two move instructions. We have one, the relocation is now gone because the linker knows how far is it from using data down to the data entry in GOT. So it will have filled in that distance in here. So then we get the address of, uh, of the data, we put that in RAX, and then we can load it uh, with a second instruction which will then go and actually fetch it. So there's a bit of an indirection here. Was there a question? Uh, what is different when we do a deal open to our shared library? When you do a DL open? Yes. Yeah, so this, uh, I should have mentioned, this is about uh, implicit dynamic linking. So when you have an executable, you just say, I link it to these SOs. When you use DL open, I've actually never used DL open, but what you do is then you, you load the, sh the shared object and then you kind of have to ask where, what's the address of all the things and you kind of have to do this thing more or less manually. I think that's how we do it. All right, yeah, so this should be fairly Quick, yeah, I said that. Okay, what about functions? What if I have this using function here in my shared object, and I'm using another function called function, and I'm calling it a couple of times. And maybe a shared object has like five globals, but maybe it has 500 functions or thousands of functions. So I don't want, when my program starts, I don't want to resolve all of this. Like maybe there are like 2,000 functions in the shared library and I use 12 of them. I don't want to resolve all of those. I want my program to start quickly. Um, so we don't, we, like for, for data, we just populate the GOT at, at uh, startup, but we don't do that for functions. Um, we could imagine that we then go every time we call the function, we basically do the, the DL open kind of thing where you actually have to go and ask where is this function and then the loader will go, oh, that one, I put it over here, I think, and here's the address and then you can call it. Doing that every time would also be expensive, so you don't want to do it every time. So what you want to do is you want to lazy load this. So the first time you call function, you have to check where it is. The second time, you don't have to check where it is. But we just mentioned that the text section in a shared object, it's shared between many processes. So you can't really lazy load it and then like fix up the address in the, uh, in the shared object because it's being used by several processes. So you have to have some kind of trick. And the trick is kind of neat. Here is the text section that we've seen many times now. And here's the using function. Here's the using function part in the, in the text section. It has a bunch of instructions. It's calling function, has a few more instructions, calling function again, and there's some more stuff. So this is our text section here. Over here, we have some other shared objects, which has uh, some other text section, which actually contains the function. So this is the thing we want to call. But we don't know yet at load time where this is. What we do have though, we have the GOT. So there is an index for all our functions. Just as for data, there's an index in the GOT for functions, but it hasn't been populated yet. So when the program starts up, it will patch up all the data locations, but not the function locations. And then comes the trick. So we have something called the PLT, which is the procedure linkage table, which is kind of a little in indirection. So you can see, when you're calling a function here from a shared object, we're not actually calling the function. We're calling function at PLT 
which is this tiny stub here. So every, pro every process has its separate GOT and its separate PLT. And this little stub here only checks what's the address of the function, and it jumps there. But the first time, that address is not there yet. Right? So the second time, it's going to be simple. We'll just look it up. Uh, the, the stub will just look it up. But what it has to do then, I've put in this little debug indicator so we can see what's going on. We're calling function at PLT. So that's simple. We just call this, this little stub function here. And this one looks up what's the address of the function. But it's not set yet. What it's set to is another stub inside ourselves. So the calling, call is going back to us again. So we look up address of function, and it's pointing here, to another stub. And then that stub calls out to the loader. So now the debug indicator is gone. It's off to the loader somewhere. And now the loader is going to do that job. Oh, we want function. Right, I loaded that in a different SO file. It's over here. I can resolve this. So you can see, try to illustrate here, when I call out to the loader, this uh, arrow here now gets fixed up by the loader, so it actually points to the real function. And then, after it's done that, the loader will actually jump to that function. So now, finally, we've gone through the stub, looked up the address, pointed back here, off to the loader, and finally we're down here. And we can keep executing that function. And when we return, um, since all of these were jumps, return will return to the last call. So jumps will just set the instruction pointer. Call will set the instruction pointer, but make sure that next time you return, you get back to the same place. So this was a call, and the rest was going through everywhere, just jumps. So when you return here, you get back to the last call, which was here. So we end up back here. And the next time we call the function, we again call the stub. But this time, the address is pointing to the right place, not back into us and then the loader and all of that stuff. So we just jump to the right place. So for, for the PLT, uh, PLT thing, you have a bit of overhead the first time you call the function, and then you have a little bit less overhead the next time you call the function. But you have to go through the stub and look up this address uh, in the GOT. But uh, yeah, I guess um, a lot of this is solved by like out of order execution and stuff, so it can actually be, be done somewhat in parallel. I didn't check that, I just made it up right now, so uh, don't take my word on it. But anyway, that's how you lazily resolve uh, functions call, function calls using the GOT and uh, the PLT. Then. Global offset table and the procedure linkage table. So in, in summary, local variables, parameters, and return values, those are simple. They just go in the registers or on the stack. For static linking, global, uh, global data is handled by relocations resolved by the linker. So the linker knows everything, so it can just fix up uh, the distances to the global data. The same for functions. The relocations will be fixed by the linker, so we get the real uh, offset to the function. For dynamic linking, global data is handled by the global offset table. So all your globals has an entry here. So uh, as the question was also, the executable has one, the shared object has one, like each shared object has one per process. And for functions, you also use the GOT, but you have to go via the stub in PLT uh, to, to be able to read that and then First time, go via the, via the loader, and the second time, and so on, you just jump directly to where you're going. And that was what happens after the compiler. Uh, 